We spend more time at work, spend more time at school than yeah. we do even at home with our own family. You know, groupthink is very powerful because if somebody does not like you, you can be chatting sense, but they will make it seem like you're chatting rubbish. Black men especially will have to tone down their voice, sit down. Oh, you don't look depressed. But somebody's depression is going to be very different to the way you experience depression. I've definitely felt very, very low. Then I'm like, why am I feeling like this? There's a small minority of people that actually enjoy what they do. When you have that mindset where you are a good worker, integral, effective, you are an asset to them. Please stop all this woke agenda. It's political correctness gone mad. Sorry, thought police. You're such a snowflake. Surely all lives matter. Ah, did those sound familiar? Here on You Can't Say Anything Anymore, we unpack the nuances of these comments and bring sidelined lived experiences to the forefront. Brought to you by Diversifying Group. Hi everyone, welcome to this month's podcast. Today we're back in the studio and we have a very special guest today. But before we start, this is You Can't Say Anything Anymore. I'm the, your host, Naomi. My pronouns are she, they. And I'm here with my very special colleague as well to help me host today. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Hi, it's Toby. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. And I am the account executive for Diversified Agencies. And I'm joining my colleague, King Naomi, on the podcast today. Great, and we have a very special guest here today. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Inga Cadmus. I'm a mental health and leadership expert and a recently TEDx speaker. Woo! Yes! Woo! Woo! Congratulations. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so please look out for your TED talk. Yes, please. yes, I'm definitely gonna look out for it. Watch that. Very exciting. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for being back thank today. You. Uh, if you cut, I wanted to catch the last episode, it was on a quick guide to starting therapy. So that was really exciting. And we thought we'd just bring you back today as oh, well thank you. With everything um yeah so we want to get started so let's talk about mental health at work and yeah. uh, specifically with the lens about looking about mental health and how racism impacts mental health and the workplace and everything so how would you define mental health what are the things that can af impact someone's mental health at work okay i like to always keep it simple Mm -hmm. um, because you could always go on Google and find the definition of mental um, health and mental illness. But I would say mental health is about how you um, perceive yourself um, in relation to the world, how you perceive yourself in relation to others um, and, you know, how you feel um, you are in relation to like your job and your workplace. Mm -hmm. as well mm. so it's really how good you feel in yourself mm. um and it's really about how um you're able to function and i guess what they say in society whatever that might mean to you right um and because we're linking it to work it's it is how you function at work and how you perceive yourself and your position within work because if you have mental health issues unfortunately it, you can't separate that from your personal life no, you and can't. your work mm. life it's, it's, it's going to show up yeah. um, especially if you work in a very high um paced you know and pressured environment as well and work is such a big thing because when you really think about it we spend more time at work spend more time at school yeah. than we do even at home with our own families Oof. so majority of our time um even on this earth is spent in some sort of occupation wow yeah. That and you really think true. about it, it. It's really hit right? hard, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. So <laughs> if you're not happy, especially with your job, um, and you've got mental health issues, underlying mental health issues, it's going to exacerbate it as well. And I think with work, beyond the work, because when people hear work, they might think job, career. It's, it's a, lot, a lot of it's linked to do your purpose. You want to feel like you're contributing something of significance to society, mm -hmm. right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, life can go really quick. And when you get to 80, 90, when you talk to a lot of elderly people, sometimes they have regrets that, oh, I wish mm -hmm. I did this and I wish I did this. And they say, don't have regrets. Right. So work is an important thing because work, you know, brings us money to live it and does. as we know we're in an economic crisis things are hard inflation so work is such an important part because if you're not if you're doing a hard job and you're not getting paid enough you're probably not happy mm. if you're doing a job that you don't like you're probably not happy <laughs> there's so many mm. factors with this so there's a small minority of people that actually enjoy what they do right a very small minority yeah. if you ask most people nowadays do you enjoy your job 90 percent of the time they don't mm. they don't mm. they're just doing it because like you said they need money they need to work to live 
So not yeah, a lot of people are not enjoying their jobs at all. And that's for some people like this, we will say let's say people that don't have um an underlying mental health issues, but let alone if you have an underlying mental health issue on top of the fact that you're not happy at work. Yeah. Right? It's going to be even more exacerbated. So tough. Right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's tough for most of us that may just have, you know, maybe just what well, mental health is a spectrum. Mm-hmm. So I just wanna maybe say that because some people say, Oh what well, I may not have depression but I sometimes feel low, which is fine. So it's just important to say that there are people with diagnosable mental health issues. Yeah. There are some people right at the borderline. You mm-hmm. just haven't been diagnosed. And there's some people that majority of people don't have a diagnosable mental health issue, but can experience similar symptoms, but just not in the it's in the acuity or severity as somebody else who has a diagnosable mental health issue. So most people have experiences feeling unmotivated, low mood, yeah. can't be bothered. But it may last a day or two. Somebody with depression that will last a bit longer. Right. Just to give some examples, yeah. or you might feel nervous starting a new job. Somebody with anxiety it can actually stop them going to a job they actually like. Yeah. Right, so these yeah. are the differences. So people go, oh, oh, I feel that. Yeah, you feel that. But it might just be somebody else might have that more prolonged right. and more persistent. That's the yeah. differences. Because I was going to say, everyone has mental health, right? But yes. Everyone's got a mental thought and... Like like you said, it, it might not be diagnosed, but everyone still experiences kind of the same type of symptoms. Um, when you're feeling low one day, feeling unmotivated, but it might not just be as far as depression. So um, I totally agree with that because I would say I've felt, I've definitely felt plenty of times very, very low, not motivated. And I'm like, why am I feeling like this? Um, there's nothing that's really triggered me at all, but I'm just not feeling up to work that day um but yeah everyone has like that mental health is just where that are physical you health. yeah we all got physical health right mm. and then we're all in the spectrum of um poor physical health or not yeah and some people have physical health issues mm-hmm. and somebody could have physical health issues but they would be very fit yeah and some of some of us could be have no physical health issues but be very unfit <laughs> and actually yeah. not be healthy so similar in that way we all have mental health and we all have physical health we all have emotional well-being these are just you everyone's born with that your mental health is about your state of mind maybe there's another way of saying it mm-hmm. your state of mind when your state of mind is disordered that's when it's a diagnosable mental health issue but we all have elements of disordered thinking right if that makes sense. What we would all be have an example of that disorder thinking then? Um, so, for example, example that you've given, right? You might just wake up one day and just feel like, just really upset. Yeah. Or let's say you do a, like you do a, okay, let's say this podcast goes out, right? And you just get negative feedback, right? That could trigger maybe back in the day when you used to get criticized from family or from right. school. And that can take you into a spiral. And maybe for a week, you just really just feel terrible. You don't talk to anybody. And the next week, you kind of get over it. Somebody else might then stay in that triggered period and the low period for longer periods. Yeah. After three months, like, what well, crap, what's wrong with me? They've now developed depression. Yeah. Right. So a lot of it is to do, you would see with depression specifically, time, length of time. Mm. So we've all probably experienced symptoms of what we say depression. How how a GP or a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist, those are the people that can diagnose those um, type of mental health issues, does it is based on time. So let's say somebody passes away, it's natural to feel you're grieving, you're sad. Now, they will probably be a bit concerned if it's lasted a whole year and a half and you're still in that level of darkness and state. That's when they'll be like, okay, maybe it's borderline under depression. Mm-hmm. So uh, some people argue that you can get diagnosed too easily because sometimes it says in, I think in the DSM, it says two weeks. Which I don't, I, don't, I think that's a bit too. Two weeks. Yeah, wow, yeah, and I think that's, that's really a bit too um, minimum. I think it should be a bit longer because I, mean, I think actually well. in this life two weeks is probably quite normal. But I now think maybe especially, six weeks, especially, especially these days. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I feel I mean? like there's lots of things really sad yeah, about exactly. for two weeks. But if it's six weeks, so yeah, so the DSM has a lot of criticisms that people feel that the the people are more diagnosed now than they was before because it seems like the the symptoms have become a bit more encompassing. So things that you think, oh, this is quite normal. It's like, oh, that's a mental health issue. It's like, well, is it a mental health issue? Um, somebody can be sad for two weeks and next week you'll be depressed. It's like, yeah. well, maybe it's actually quite normal. Maybe if it was for six weeks or two months, then. So mm. it, that's why when people say they've got depression, they've been diagnosed. You do have to understand that sometimes the GP can just diagnose you. You could, you could have a bad month and you'd be really sad for two weeks and get diagnosed with depression. You think, but wait a minute, I'm not actually depressed. Um, maybe after three weeks, you, you got out of that mode. Um, and there's obviously this different, um, different, 
what they call it different depression so there's like depression is one um, umbrella term but it's actually yeah, different exactly. depression the same way there's different anxiety like there's social anxiety general anxiety agoraphobia you know, OCD is part of the anxiety right. um, table. And then you've obviously got schizophrenia. And within that, you've got um, schizoaffective disorder. You've got like different levels of psychosis as well. Um, and the way I tell people about this and to make it easier is that it sometimes the diagnosis isn't as important. It's about what it means to you. Because That's somebody's sweet. depression is going to be very different to the way you experience depression. Mm -hmm. Somebody, I've been depressed and I didn't get diagnosed. I didn't, I didn't go to the GP when I was really depressed, but that's partly because my GP was really rude. <laughs> and yeah. I just didn't yeah, think he was not. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that, that, I wouldn't even think to go to the GP anyways. Mm -hmm. But um, when, uh, when I, my depression was very high functioning, so I wouldn't. So be you looked see. normal. So basically, yeah. So do people think, oh, well, you don't look depressed. Yeah, yeah but I wouldn't show. Yeah, I'm not sad. I'm only, at home. I'm sad see. in my bed. Yeah. yeah. You know, even my mum didn't know. Um, and I was still doing things. I was going to school. I was working. I was doing everything that you need to do. But I was just sad, like right. just just like the, a husk. Yeah, just a husk of what wow. a shell of myself. But I, but because also I've got extroverted personality as well. So a lot of extroverted personalities type people will find themselves in a situation where they're depressed. It's very difficult to be seen because you're. Miley, you're the life of the party, right. you're making sure. And also there was this kind of weird dynamic with my friends back in the day, and now it's not there anymore, mm -hmm. that if I was quiet or sad, everybody got concerned and it affected them because mm -hmm. they're not used to yeah. me being that way. Yeah. And it's like, what's going on, what's going on? So I found that very uncomfortable. So I'll quickly go, you know, back to my normal you, life. You don't want it to be like showing. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah, then yeah. everybody's thinking like, what's going on, you're, yeah, are you okay, yeah, what, what's up? And you're also only, yeah. everybody has a role. So sometimes like, I don't know, in your, in your friendship group, right? You might be the mummy bear. Yeah. And if you're no longer the mummy bear, they don't know what might happen is that if you start like people that stop people pleasing, when they stop people pleasing, they find that their friends withdraw because they're upset. Like, why are you not people pleasing anymore? Why are you not doing things for me anymore? Why are you mm -hmm. why are you say you right. know? The dynamic is changing the I relationships, see. right? That's why people stay because they realize that if they stop being a people pleaser, so if they stop at work, for example, saying, Oh, I can do it. Oh, I, I can do that. I'll, I'll organize the party. I'll do all of this. I'll do all of that. I'll, I'll do all of that, all of that. Where are they? Are they going to be valued in the company? Are people going to remember them? You know, the thought of not saying yes and the thought of not helping out is so scary because you're afraid of being rejected. You're afraid of maybe like, you know, passing over a promotion. You're basically scared of not being being relevant. Yeah. Right. And not being wanted okay. and needed. Is that the essential part about people pleasing then? Yeah, everybody's reasons is different. So some people will be scared of abandonment. It could be scared of rejection, but there's a fear. People, people please because of a fear of something that's unpleasant that they're going to experience because they experienced it when they were younger. When they didn't do something, they had the consequence of it and it was too much, they didn't like the consequence. Right, I need to start writing these down. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very important thing we all need to start learning and start yeah. really just sort of getting that inside. Yeah. I feel like people pleasing is one of the most talked about things lately, especially in the work yeah. context. You know, as you just give all those examples about like volunteering to do things, overstretching yourself, like people pleasers can really stress themselves out as well exactly. because you're just constantly because I was listening to an influencer this morning doing one of her vlogs on YouTube and she said that last year she had to really be harsh with herself and her friends and family around her to stop being a people pleaser because she was too stressed saying yes 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 all the time right. and she she wore herself out so she said that she had to really like change into a militant in a way and start saying no. And unfortunately, like you said, she lost friends. Right. She but couldn't. Like, would they really be real friends though, I guess? No, no, probably not. Because if you're always expecting something from your friend all the time and then when they can't show up, you're not being sympathetic and compassionate to their situation. Which is not good. That's not a friend, is it? When I'm yeah, low. Yeah. But what? Can I, can I put a spot yeah. on? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. So let me say that. I wouldn't say that we're not real friends. I would say that if this is how things happen, is right. Mm -hmm. We all unconsciously operate. So when you look at your friends, you meet a particular need for them, they meet a I particular see. need for mm. you. So if you're the person that is people pleasing, they've got probably a personality that likes people doing things for them. Yeah. So it fits really nicely. Mm. It's like, like a you symbiotic relationship. Yeah, symbi yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, you do right. things for them and they okay. like you doing things for them. They're always dependent. They always need something. Oh my God, well, babe, can you help me get my head done? Oh, babe, can you order me that, order me that thing? Da -da 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 -da. Right. And you're like, yeah, babe, I'll do it. I'm on Amazon now. What do you want? <laughs> All of that stuff. But then when a person goes, actually, this is not serving me anymore. I'm going yeah. to change. Yeah. That person, 
um, that friend might experience rejection. Yeah. So they're not yeah, necessarily, no, it's not always, oh, you're not doing anything for me. It could be like, oh my God, they feel rejected now. They don't yeah, understand. Yeah, the dynamic okay, has changed. I and because it's an unconscious yeah, thing, yeah. most people are not going to sit there and go, oh, I like to use my friends. No one's thinking yeah. like yeah, that. Yeah, okay. They're thinking, oh, you've changed. Yeah, I see. you're no longer there for me anymore. You're not. You're not. You're not so a supportive this, friend. This dynamic, and then when you don't get it, they're like, "Oh wow, is this like you're not being a friend?" Yeah, yeah. so they're, they're probably the interpreting that as that okay, influencer. Okay. Yeah. You're not a friend for me. You're not there for me anymore. Okay, yeah. Not realizing yeah. that yeah. she's just changed a dynamic that see. was no longer serving her. Yeah. So we, you've got to also change, and she, they did. They made. They decided to choose to withdraw, withdraw themselves. But it, and sometimes this is my this is my issue with therapists when i teach my clients to change their dynamic i say that you have to communicate that right because you don't understand that that person's got their own dynamic that, they, that they're mm -hmm. not fully aware of mm -hmm. so you can't actually get angry at some people around you because they don't know they're un it's all unconscious no one's sitting yeah. there consciously trying to just use people. Some people are, Some but people most people are, are not. See. It's all unconscious. So it's not as simple as like, oh, yeah. I just want a good friend. Exactly. Okay, I get you. It could be that they've, they've perceived your no now as their rejection because they've always heard your yes. I see your yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And, it and if you communicated yeah. that to them, um, them and they might go, oh my God, it's true, babes. I'm always like, I'm always calling <laughs> yeah. you. I need to learn how to stand on my own. Yeah, okay. Then you sense. can reshape and renegotiate the friendship now. It's when, it's when they withdraw themselves and they're not willing to to change themselves and compromise, yes. yeah, that's when it's like a yeah. red flag. Yes. Mm. It's a red flag then. Mm -hmm. And we don't communicate as friends, right? Mm. I know we're talking about workplaces, but when you think about it romantically, we would do, what are we, right? <laughs> well, with friendships, we don't do that. We're just our friends. Well, this yeah. work, and when work things friends change, well. and yet even in work friends, right? Yeah, yeah. Even the fact that we call them work friends is so mad, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. As if they're not like a real friend. Yeah. Because sometimes when you leave work, you no longer see them anymore. You, <laughs> them. You, put, you, you, you know how you, when you're talking to someone, you friend zone them? Yeah. You friend zoned <laughs> oh, your work you, friend. I like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So you put, you've made it clear to them, so like, true. you're my work friend. <laughs> so outside of work, do not call me, do not text yeah. me, do not do these things. You've work zone there. <laughs> sometimes you can like misread though. And like sometimes yeah. you can think that they're your actual friend or they, they can think that about you. And then they try to like arrange something. Yeah. And there's like a bit of like, um, I don't know how to say, um, non symbiosis, I want to say. Mm. And then you, you didn't realize that you were in their work friend zone, but they were uh, in They yours. were in your personal friend yeah, zone. So like, then, yeah. Like communication again. Communication is important, but I think it's, we're not, you know, Unless we're five years on and we go, do you want to be my friend? We don't really do that anymore, do we? We kind of just are, oh, we're just friends. Have you ever used your full name at work? Like in a work context? Yeah, I have. And it's... it's you didn't, how was your experience on that? It's always... When I was younger, I used to be very, very frustrated because I was like, why can no one pronounce my name when someone can pronounce... What's, what's that? Um, is it Schwarzenegger? Under Schwarzenegger. Well, how do you say it? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, everyone can pronounce that. I don't think we're saying it right there. I just know how we say it, but we just say Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I, don't think, I think it's Schwarz. We can Schwarz say like Tchaikovsky, can't we? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone Schwarz can pronounce Tchaikovsky. 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 It's the Tchaikovsky. you know the one from Sleeping Beauty, like the. Yeah, I can't say names. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah, terrible yeah. pronouncing anyone's name. But I, everyone, most people can pronounce that, but no one can pronounce my name. And I was very like aggravated. But as I've got older, I'm like, I don't really care now. Like. You can butcher my name as much as you want. I un I understand now, but yeah, I've had to use it in the workplace many, many of times. And some people have been like, "I'm not even gonna pronounce. I'm gonna bother to pronounce this name." Mm. Oh. I was like, "Wow, could you at least try?" Yeah. Mm. How did that like make you feel then? If you if you don't mind, sharing? it made me feel irrelevant. Mm. Yeah, that you can say other people's name, but you can't say mine just mm. because it's something that is not of the everyday norm mm. name. So. I just, I would just quickly pipe up and say, this is how you say my name, but people call, go, I go by Toby, if that's easier for you. And then I'll just keep it pushing. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it's just not nice really, yeah. but it is what it is. I've, I've come to terms with it. There has been, there has been research that has indicated that people with um, potentially African sounding names um, and in America with like typical black sounding like Shaniqua, Shaniswa, right. um, may not get, um, seen for jobs. Yeah, and I'm that's, not surprised about that. Yeah, that's, it's, an, it's, that's it's another... Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's sad, but it's just yeah. really true. Like, because I, I the agree. stigma that's behind that name is... She's she's probably rude. Yeah. She's not oh, maybe ghetto. uneducated. Yeah. She's not gone to school properly. Yeah. Exactly. When we when we know for fact, especially women, mm -hmm. um, in America specific and even in the UK, mm -hmm. um, um, Asians and black, particularly like Chinese and Indian and then um, black African are usually even more overqualified 
than everybody else. Always. So making the assumption is actually ridiculous. We're probably overqualified for the job that we've been we applying for. English. Yeah, yeah like we're actually overqualified for the job that we're usually applying <laughs> for. That's how bad it is. Yeah. Mm. So it's a wrong assumption, but yeah, that's where a lot of people with African sounding names. So where somebody whose name is Shayon, I can't say the name properly, they would do Sean because they know that ah, if they put their full Yoruba name, <laughs> yeah, uh, is this, it may not they may not be seen, but if they make it seem as English as possible, then they might get to the interview. So yeah. that's why I don't know if in your company they're trying to do don't put people's names, just put their CV without a name, so you can judge based on the qualifications, the experience, mm. then if you see a name and think, oh, where's that person from? Let's guess the geography. <laughs> Let's guess where that person's from. Okay. Right, next question. So, how does racism and feelings of exclusion, especially in the workplace, impact mental health? Mm, terribly, I think for most people. Mm -hmm. I think there's always going to be a small minority of people that just, that they, they take it in and they just, they, they become like bulldozers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's me, I'm that type of person, but it's because of my background. For most people, racism and, you know, you could even be colorism in some instance, but racism and exclusion. Oh, you want to explain for our listeners, like the difference between colorism? Okay, I feel like a lot of people are quite like confused. Yeah, about, yeah, oh, yeah. So if you could just like- Very the, simply, yeah, colorism yeah. is a sister race. Colorism is uh, an experience, is a, a phenomenon that's described as, um, discrimin discrimination in, so let's say this is me, black people, um, discrimination to darker skin tone black people, darker skin tone Asian people. It only exists within usually um, people of melanated um, complexion, meaning that Asian mm. white people, you, you have to find a different term if there's colorism there. <laughs> but <laughs> but with, with Asians and black people, anyone with melanated skin like we do, mm -hmm. is it's discrimination towards darker skin tone. It's not reverse colorism, that's a different name. Yeah, because people would say, oh, but light skin, light skin Asians or uh, um, black people will have their own situation, but it's not called colorism. Colorism, defined, go on Wikipedia, it tells you, mm -hmm. <laughs> is discrimination against darker skin tone of people in the same, same race. Yeah, in the, in the same, yeah. yeah. So yeah. White Hierarchy person can't be colorist to me, although it, they can in a certain way because they can prefer a darker, a lighter skinned black person. But yeah, we wouldn't call that colorism. It's just racism. Right. But you're you're preferring a light skinned the person. Colorism is the dynamic created into the group. Yes, into group on, forced, forced on by systemic racism. Yeah, and creating the hierarchy of lighter yeah. is better because yeah. lighter is closer to white. In everyone as well it is just it it, blows, no, it doesn't blow my mind. We all know why, <laughs> but I'm saying that it's just every group. It is just, it is yeah. that de facto, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And there's this, this, yeah. So that's it. So th they probably, they, there is that in certain dynamics at work if you're working in a lot of, if you're working in a very ethnic environment. But for most people, racism would be what they would experience. Um, and it, racism means that if you're experiencing any kind of discrimination, prejudice against your skin color, and obviously if you're now a woman or a man, you have that intersectionality, et cetera, et cetera, and, you, and you're excluded, that means you're excluded from probably promotions, you're excluded from just informal, of it, oh, we're going to the pub. I might not want to go to the pub, but why wasn't I invited at least yeah. to yes, go to yeah, the pub? Yeah. Um, you know, you're just you're excluded from what happens at work. And we've already talked about how for most people, work is what they do most of the time. Mm -hmm. Nine to five, eight to four, eight to six. You're in work more than you're at home. Mm -hmm. So if you're excluded from things at work, it can be very isolating. Very, very demoralizing. Um, just we'll just be seen as you know the blah blah one. Yeah, it's just it's just terrible. You have no you like there's something about if you know you go to a team meeting you've got a friend and you just go with your coffee and you're talking and then you sit and then you have your meeting. That's something it feels nice. But imagine just going on your own and sitting down and everyone's chit chatting together and, and you're just you're by yourself your and you're just on your own. Then when you speak that typical thing like back in secondary school, especially like secondary school when you speak and everyone's sniggering. <laughs> 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 yeah. Even if people are not doing that because they're adults and they're not going to snigger at you, you feel that way, right? right because yeah. you're not having that kind of like, say it, speak it, or mm, you're, seeing, you're, you're seeing people that you like kind of nodding their head because you're talking sense. You can be making a lot of sense, but somebody's just like, and you know groupthink is very powerful. Mm. Because if somebody does not like you, you can be chatting sense, but they will make it seem like you're chatting rubbish. Yeah. yeah. So you can be in a situation where you say something to your, your, your whoever, your manager, in the team meeting, you might say, you know what, guys, I think that we should, for International Women's Day today, we should do a nice post and celebrate everyone. And suddenly be like, mm. then somebody else will say the exact same yeah. thing. And they'll be like, oh, that's and a brilliant like, oh my God, idea, Tracy. I've, I've never heard of it before. Yeah. yeah. And you're sitting amazing. there like, what? Well, you always have the great ideas. Yeah. I literally Those, just said that. Exactly. Those are the small examples of how you would feel excluded. And yeah, it's just, yeah. there is no way eight hours of a day that you can just take that and just feel okay. 
Yeah. That makes a lot of sense as you compiled on. Yeah, and mm. day after day after day after and day. And you're bringing, when you, when you start to bring that home as well, it's mm. not good because like you said, you're at, you're at work. All the time. Majority of your life. Because you you go to work nine to five, and then by the time you get home, relax, sit down, eat your dinner, it's nine o'clock. Exactly. And then you want to go to bed. Exactly. It's like a recycling. It's a cycle. So being in that mentally all the time and feeling excluded. Yeah. Being undermined. Yeah. Feeling racism as well. Like, yeah. it can. You yeah. can't escape it. And it's no, not yeah, always exact, work. direct. Very few people nowadays. Indirect. Is, yeah. is going to be like, you yeah. N word, you this or that. It's or going like to be via physical, undermining. Yeah. It's going to be via passive aggressive emails. Yeah. Or, or um, like, Singling you out. Singling you out. Um, you make a mistake and the mistake is not even major, but it becomes a big deal. Yeah. Or somebody takes credit for the work that you, you know, you've done. It's these little things that happen and they are they're, they're small erosions of your self esteem, right. of, of your confidence. It's like I said, when you when you speak, you sp you're speaking well. They'll be like, oh, we don't understand what you're saying. Can you say that again? Making you question yourself, but you begin to like, you basically feel like you're gaslit. Yeah. Like, mm. you know, is it not making any? What is going on? Am I not yeah. making any sense? Yeah. And like I said, work is about feeling like you're contributing to society. So if you're trying to contribute to society, but you're being told that your contribution is worthless. That's going to that's going to knock your self esteem and your confidence. Interesting, I guess as well. How much would you say then, like this, um, the kind of like self combat of like stereotypes specifically? You know, you have in your mind like ideas about that people have stereotypes about you that you know you've, you've developed and known throughout your life because people have reacted to you in a certain way or they've like just said things about you or assumed things about you. And then what would you say then was how does that affect you when you bring it to work? You, you, you know, people, some people like try and we always hear that people who overcompensate, you know, mm. about like to combat a certain stereotype or try and go the Okay, way. so yeah. like if for example, me and Toby will have the angry black woman, yeah. you might have the docile like Asian woman, right? So when, so even like this, I could be, we're speaking, this is not aggressive, but let's say somebody else, um, or maybe let's say a white person and we're having a conversation, she might be like, oh, you know, she might be doing this, I'm doing my hands and she's, why are you moving back? Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not attacking you. Or she might even be like, oh, like calm down. You're like, huh? I'm calm. We're having a really good conversation. Or a friend even gave me an example where she was talking to a person, a recruiter actually, um, and was just really grateful and said, look, if I ever, if I ever saw you, this was in real life, I'd get, get you a drink. It was just like you know when you're trying to show your appreciation. Next, the next day, her husband said to her, did you ask for this person's personal number? And she was like. Mm? No, I just said, if I saw you, I would have loved to pre da, 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 da. It was like, how did this person perceive a conversation? I was just really grateful for you as, yeah, she wants my personal number. She was begging to be my friend. That's to me, that's quite scary. That that is, you can just be right. really friendly to somebody. Somebody say, right, oh, I think you're this. Or you were having a passionate conversation. You're being a very aggressive. That's what makes being in a workplace kind of scary because... Thankfully, came to her husband. But imagine if it was a manager mm. saying that mm. you're 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 being unprofessional in the workplace because see, you are crossing yeah. boundaries, and you're thinking, me, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a friend. I just said, if I saw you in real life, it would be good. We can get a coffee for me to show you appreciation. Uh, yeah, it's just a friendly thing. To it's say. a friendly thing to say. It, just, it doesn't like it's not that deep. And you know what the problem is with something like that? It's it's going to be based off he say she say. Mm. You've got no proof to say. So that person can really gaslight the yeah, situation. Yeah, and ruin your reputation. And ruin it. And in in a racism aspect, who are they going to believe most of the time? Exactly, exactly. And, and in that in moment- in gender roles, who are they going to believe exactly. most of the time? Exactly. A yeah. male they're going to believe. Exactly. So it's, it's annoying. Yeah. And in that moment, you're actually vexed and you're thinking, crap, now I'm I'm seeming like I'm angry, but I am angry because that person's lied against me. You're just going to get lazy. And your manager will say, yeah. calm down. You're like, how can you, if that was you, wouldn't you be upset? Right. If somebody if was, told you- If it was multiple times of your life, continuously, if it wasn't like, this is not the, your first rodeo, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Not the first time you've been So, and or... you mentioned a good point about the stereotype. One of the things that a lot of black women feel is this, um, and I think a lot of women of color before this, is this kind of sense of, uh, what's the word? Um, editing themselves. You've got to edit yourself. Like when you're trying to speak or really passionate about something, you might hold your hands like this because you know that if you start using your hands and you might have to slow down how you speak. Um, and obviously I come from, um, London, I come from a particular area in London that we speak like, I don't speak like this, but we have a certain way of you speaking. Have a certain lingo. So now when you're in a corporate sector and a work, you know, obviously I'm not going to speak like that because there's a professional way of speaking, right? That, that to be, you know, that's not like, it's not professional, but me speaking like that when I'm really passionate, it will come out more when I'm passionate. I'm like, crap, they, they may assume something else. They might assume that I'm not educated enough. So I might have to speak as someone, it's constantly self edited it's tiring. Yeah. Cause when you're with your friends, you're relaxed, you do, 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 ah, when you're at work, 
Oh yes, sir. Okay, sir. It's a lot of self editing. Very robot, like yeah, beep, very, very. Beep, beep. just Thank just you. to say the same thing. So if I'm passionate, and the thing is, people, are, you know, especially Monday mornings, boy, don't be too excited because people look at you like, are you okay? It's like, why should I edit myself yeah. for your uncomfortability, mate? If you don't like Monday morning, that's your business, bro. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Why have I got at all calm? Because it seems like I'm too overly excited yeah. for Monday mornings. Or And a lot of people have it. A lot of the people in your audience that are listening will have the, if you're a man, you know, again, especially men, that aggression. They've got to really, black men especially, will have to tone down their voice, sit down. Don't let them stand up and talk in front of a white woman sitting down. Oh, my God. How does that look like? Mm. Or standing in front, standing up in front of a white man looks like you're. Like, we'll go and go. No, I'm just talking to you as my manager. Or I'm just talking to you yeah. as a colleague. These are the things. Not everyone experiences that, and I've been fortunate not to experience that. But I've seen other colleagues experience that. And what makes it really worse is that it's not always obvious. You're constantly thinking. Do you think was that my profession? You have yeah, to question yeah, yeah, You're not yeah, even yeah. like, oh, most people, honestly, yeah. don't go, yeah, that's racism. You're, you're thinking it must be something else. Maybe she yeah. got a bad day. Maybe it's my breath. Yeah, Try yeah. to give them the no, no, yeah, benefit yeah, of exactly. the doubt. Yeah, exactly. until you before cross you every, go there. Yeah. Before you go yeah. there. And then you're calling your friends like, did you think this was? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Trying to get a second opinion. Exactly. And then when you realise it is, it's so hurtful. Yeah. Because you think, really? Like, they went there? Yeah. That's where your mind went with the... Come on. So imagine if you've got an underlying mental health issue. Mm. And let's say that some people, they, they've they gone through trauma, they're okay at work, you know, they, they haven't, the things haven't, the trauma has not erupted. Work can trigger that. You know, okay. long working hours, pressurized environment, unrealized, I'm um, sorry, unrealistic demands and expectations, a difficult manager, a toxic workplace, that's all toxicity really, See, yeah. but a, a, you know, a bad manager, terrible colleagues, right. just terrible pay. <laughs> all of that can then build up stress and prolonged stress can then develop into a physical health issue, let alone a mental health issue. They're very inter interrelated. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that experience mental health issues in the workplace pro will likely have maybe ulcer issues. They'll have a lot of physical health mm -hmm. issues going on. Yeah. So it's very much interlinked. And then what happens when you don't, when you don't have that? Imagine a person working all their life and they go on benefits now. They've never been on benefits before. It's gonna yeah. And they've got exactly. kids, and they've got children, they've got yeah. family, so and then now they're owning their mortgage. Yeah. It just becomes a cycle, right? right? It becomes it becomes difficult. Or a loved one passes, um, and you don't, you know, you're, and then you go into a depression, and then you get off sick, and then you come back, and you know, some places when you come off sick and you come back, they're angry because obviously you left them, and then someone else has got to take over your workplace. So, so many things can happen, let alone just the work environment. It could just happen in life, and it affects work. And you're not able to work, and then when you come back to work in certain environments like tech it goes so fast that six months a year out you're like crap what's happened new technology new software you feel like you're behind and then if you haven't got a good manager that's supportive and understanding then you could be feeling alone isolated especially if you're the only black person the only person of color in that environment who do you speak to you haven't so, got anyone to look at and laugh at in the room or something dumb is said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different things in a workplace. That's why it really is. I know we're going to go talk on another question, but it's really, really important that when you go to a job right now, you look at, you know, what are the policies? How are you supported? You know, what are my, how do I get my needs met? Because I know some people, as an employer myself, right, again, I'm aware that most of my employees are in my in work more than they are in their own personal lives. So I've got to make sure that work is a good environment for them. Because the way I see it, and maybe it's because I'm a therapist, if your personal life is affecting you, it's gonna affect your work life. So if you're going through um, stuff, I want you to sort out your stuff because I know it's gonna affect work. And I want you happy. When you're happy, you do better work. When you're what not do happy, you yeah. do good work. Definitely. What do you think about that saying that's been around for years, you leave your personal issues at the door? When you go to work. Yeah. I think it was because, um, particularly in the Western world, it was made for a lot of, you know, what the Western work was made for white men, right? So that's how they operated. Um, that's why, and that's another conversation, but that's why I, I tell people that it's not just a black and Asian thing, that's that there's a lot of stigma. Uh, lower class white people still have that, and even middle class. It's just that they might seem more like, oh, we're more open and progressive. But no, um, back in the day, you couldn't. Even some white places now, it's still that culture. Like, why are you coming to work? You better not be crying. Yeah. Why are you looking sad and upset? Yeah. So put a smile on your face, right? Um, and it's because I guess there was a belief that 
you know, it was very separated. Work is work. You do what you got to do. And then home life is what you have to do. Uh, I, I don't think it's that bicultural now. I don't think it's that that bi bipartisan. I think things are very much merged right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think human beings now have evolved to the point where not everyone can split off. There's still some people that can do it really well. Yeah. Um, whether that's healthy, I wouldn't say it's healthy, but people can do it. Uh, you got the, um, the baby boomers. They can be going through a divorce, but they'll come you'll and never, you'll never yeah, know, right? But yeah. Gen X's, maybe they're a bit okay, but for millennials, almost, yeah, we're not good at it. So really, truly, yeah. <laughs> um, and we, should, we, we shouldn't need to. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we can separate it because work and personal are all intermixed. Yeah. If we really think about right. it, um, it's, it's all intermixed. If you wake up and you're, I don't know, you get, a, I don't know, you get told that you've got one month eviction. I don't know how you can go to work and just be like this. You're sitting there thinking, crap, like, you know, where am I going to live? I, yeah. I live, the family, yeah. you know, I, do, can I find somebody somewhere close to get work, food. school of your yeah. children? Yeah, I, I think it's very unrealistic to expect somebody to not bring that to work. What would be important is if 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 you if you're in a safe environment, if you've got a psychological safe environment, you can go to your manager and say, look, I, I, I've just been told this. I can't focus. Can I take a week off? emergency week off to just sort it out because that's probably all you need to say look let me do an emergency week off let me talk to friends and family because we've all moved so it's not that we can't move but when you're at work and you're thinking crap what the the fallout from this is that's when it becomes stressful but yeah. if you had a week off to say actually there are lots of um properties on on rent that i can get in the area that's not really a big deal it's not as big as those you think. But if you're going to work immediately, you don't have that time to space right. to think and reflect. It becomes, oh my God, I can't take it. And the next minute you're off sick. When if you had a week off and your manager allowed that and said, you know, it's just totally understandable. Take as much time as you need. You'll be back the next week. Yeah, yeah, I found the place. We're going to move in three weeks time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, can you need that one week to say, okay, can I find somewhere that affect my children? Oh yeah. Oh, I didn't have a place similar pricing. But when you don't have that space and you go to it and you're expected to act like a robot and just be okay and just continue, that's where the pressure just um you know piles up and then the person breaks down when potentially that could have been avoided with an understandable manager. But that's if the person feels they can talk to the manager right. in the first place because the workspace is safe. If you haven't got that, you're not going to do that. And you will then keep it to yourself and then be stressed for that whole month and then go to the GP and get um, asked for sick leave because you're not working in a safe environment, in an environment where you can talk about your mental health and not be judged yeah. right. for it. I see. Definitely. Yeah, I guess that kind of moves on to my next question is about like what can people do to like build safe spaces, build communities, and like especially like in the kind of context of racism things, how can they kind of... Um, help with that at work and kind of help themselves. If I'm honest, can you really, can you, if something is already polluted, what can you do to um, unpollute it? I think you could only buffer yourself. Right. And, you know, because a lot of people stay in these working environments because of many things they don't believe that they can get another another thing. So many factors contribute to why people just stay in poor working environments, right? So my reality is if uh, millennials and Gen Zs are very different, you know, we probably will be like, Psh. <laughs> notice, um, where Gen, Gen Xs and baby boomers will be like, we are staying here, <laughs> regardless of the thing. So I do think it does depend on a person's um, generation, mindset with me. Um, when I was being bullied at work years ago, and I was a te teaching assistant, um, I was I was an agency teaching assistant. So oh, you had to go out to the schools in the morning at like. No, I did that, but I had a, a fixed position in that oh, place. Okay, but I was right. an agent. I was paid, oh. being paid by oh, agency, okay, right, so I knew that it, uh, it would be difficult to get a job because the way the school year starts, like right, TAs needing yeah, TA. I didn't want to go from knowing that I'm working in the same school every day to now having to do like yeah, call in the morning. Right, I didn't want that. So I felt stuck. And I also, I was trained to be a social worker. So I knew that I'm by July, bye, I ain't seen you guys again. Yeah. So I kind of felt like I can, it was really difficult, but I just felt, let me just stay there, even though I was depressed and I was getting severely bullied. Mm -hmm. It was just like that. Um, now I wouldn't do that, but I understood why I did that then. It was like, well, I'm going to be training as a social worker in a couple right. of months. So you um, could see there was a light. I was like, at the end of the, the, light, the, end of the, end of the tunnel. So in my head, it was like, okay. So the, I'm a very realist. I really think that I don't think you can unpollute. You yourself cannot unpollute, especially if you're on your own. So if you're like one of the only black people, only Asian people, look, my, my, my thing would be plan 
strategize to get out of there personally. <laughs> I wouldn't be trying to make a, a bed of roses and thorns. That's not me, right? But if it's um, if there's a, some of you and you feel like it's not as bad and it can change, it could just be a manager. You know, sometimes it's just like one manager right, or two managers, person. but the rest of the people yeah. are really good. Right. Then you could try and make it better right. by creating groups. Um, not groups that they create for you, your own separate groups, mm. like really support groups have and you formal groups. Before? Have you ever been a part of those? Have you ever been a part of those, Toby? At work? Yeah. Like, um, mm, like I don't... Asian networks or anything? No. You know, no. <laughs> Most of my workplaces have been quite diverse. Oh, really? in, the, in the other podcast when we were speaking, remember I said, I only mentioned there was only one place where it wasn't too diverse, but I didn't work there. But most of my places that I've worked at have been very, very diverse. Oh, really it's good. maybe one or two places where it hasn't. And kind of like you, I saw I had an end of the tunnel come in <laughs> and I said, am I gonna stick through this or should I just leave? And I was in two minds and I said, well, I'm leaving soon, so I don't really care. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to put up with ride, this to leave. Ride through it, yeah. Ride through it, unfortunately. Um, and like you said, if I, I was one of the, I was the only black female at that place and there was not really much, unfortunately I can do, it was for a massive company and I'm, I'm at the bottom of the food chain. Yeah. Mm. It was, it was <laughs> actually. So I was in the tele sales in the store working as a, um, uh, an advi a customer advisor. So imagine, imagine me trying to get to the headquarters, yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to change. Change the entire giant group. like hive. Yeah, yeah. policy, I, yeah. I couldn't do it. So I was- and Thank you for saying that because sometimes you hear these things that change, like sometimes you can't, you're right at the bottom. Like yeah, right at the yeah, bottom. Yeah. Look, the, the, also the, the, like all your energy is gonna be doing that. Yeah, yeah, it's just not really realistic. The realistic thing is to just get another job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in all honesty, and then when you, but when you do apply for jobs, look at, when you're now looking, what are you looking for? Yeah. Because sometimes it's not always about money. Sometimes it is about like, the the learning and development the well being package that you're kind of got, got to get because again you spend a lot of time at work so if you get sick how do they look after you if you get sick because what I do tell people is that we are also very replaceable <laughs> so don't be loyal not the way our parents are loyal to a job <laughs> don't be loyal because they'll quickly replace you very quickly so yeah. when you when you have that mindset where you are a good worker you are integral you're effective yeah. you that you are an asset to them. But you also recognize that with the way the job market is, is that they will they can replace you, mm -hmm. and or you can get redundant if you know the times are hard. You know uh, what do you call it? all these big companies let people go. Right. So you re then begin to realize that I never see a job for life. I always tell people strategize. I call it future proof in your career. Think about where your end goal is. Where do you want to be? And that is also part of how you look after your mental health. You've got to be strategic. You don't come into a workplace and say this is going to be me for a very long time. Mm. Right. If that is you. I, I don't have to work with those people because I have to. I like to work with people that say, I say, look, have once you once you start a job, I say have an exit strategy. You serious? Yeah, and the exit strategy might be to get promoted. Okay, so have like a goal. Yeah. But have a goal. Have a yeah, goal. Right. You just go into yeah. a job to need, be a job. Need to, need to complete this. Blah blah blah. There's a reason. What do I need to yeah. do yeah. to yeah. get there? Get out. Yeah. Of the job. Yeah, 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 and it's because, like I said, for me, unless you're in a really job that is a very like my job, the my employees, I'm trying to incubate them to support them personal development all of this different stuff but not every manager is like me some managers are just there to do their job as well and so you can go into an environment and two years time still be in the same entry level and think but wait a minute like where's my progression yeah where am i going and then you when you sidestep you're like but i'm sidestepping into this exact same role you want to go into a job or into your career to develop yourself it could be you're doing that just to get money to do a business whatever it is but have a strategy <laughs> um because if not uh it is uh it's boring it's understimulating. <laughs> um, and also when situation may occur, it can feel very, you feel trapped. Yeah. yeah. But the most important thing, if you know that you're an asset, you can never feel trapped. Right. You can say, okay, I'm going through this. It's not really, really good. Do I have the means to actually support people? And I'm at the bottom of the food chain. I can't do nothing. Can I send an email to HR? Maybe that. Oh, wait, I'm going to wait to my exit interview. I will tell you all about yourself when I leave. <laughs> um, but for those people that might be in middle management now, that you might have a bit more power, look at the your policies and procedures. Mm. Um, speak to your senior leaders. Mm. What can you do to create an environment for those that are below you that you can see having a hard time? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I will talk to those those at a uh, middle and higher level, right? I know you're just working, but remember how it felt when you were at the bottom of the rung. Right. What can you do to make sure people that look like you, not even necessarily even look like you, just that every single person in you and below you and those at your level feel included and feel safe 
and feel comfortable when they're coming to work because at the end of the day again we spend so much time at work it's so important people realize that that it is important that you're you're working in the environment you can't please everyone that i'm not denying some people are always going to have issues but for most people that are reasonable all they want to do is they come to the workplace they feel empowered they feel that they can speak their mind they feel like they are contributing to the growth of the business of the company or what have you, that their voice has impact. That's all people want to feel. Right. And that potentially there are, you know, bonuses or promotion opportunities, right? People rather be told that say, look, right now, we can't pay anybody for the next two years. So if you need to find another job, we would advise you to potentially. Um, but for those that, you know, are not going to, um, we're aware that the heavy workload is heavy. How can we support that? Rather than saying you're not getting paid, we get that it's very hard to get paid, but if you feel like you're getting more work on top of not getting right. paid more, that's why people get frustrated. Or when you hear somebody else has got a bonus, you think, well, wait a minute, they've got a bonus. Or when you just, you start to see differences, not always racial, just like you see certain people getting promoted, you're not getting promoted, when you just see unfair practices in the right. workplace. So everybody listening, what I'll say is, read your policies. If you've been in your job for a year, six months, you're thinking, crap, go back to your contract. Going back to your package of care, read that. That, that is going to arm you and go, crap, did I just sign a contract and I'm not given any support whatsoever? And then if you can reach out to your HR, reach out to them, send them a message so they can I speak to you because they should listen to their employees because they are trying, HR's job is to make um, employees feel safe, mm -hmm. um, 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 feel comfortable, all of that mm -hmm. stuff. That is really HR's job. So if HR is not doing a good job, run. <laughs> And I want to just um, encourage your audience, do not feel stuck and feel trapped, right? right. I, that's the reason why I'm pushing people to say, like, leave jobs, is when you realise that, yes, it's hard, I'm not saying it's easy, like, you can just apply for a job and get it, it isn't easy. But if you realise that you have an asset, you are an asset, I need my employees. Mm -hmm. Like, as right. a business owner, I need you. Yeah, you need me, but I don't think I'm saying that I actually need you. you. Without you, <laughs> I couldn't be sitting yeah. in a podcast and I'm still getting paid. <laughs> yeah. I need you. When you understand that you are needed, even if at the bottom, middle, wherever you are on the, the, the totem pole, you will recognize you've, you've got a bit of power. Right. I don't mean that that means you can negotiate. I'm not saying, I'm not giving that advice. I'm just saying, do not stay in the position in the job where you're not being appreciated. It's just not worth your mental state. It's not worth your, it's not, the personal cost is not worth it. Mm -hmm. It isn't worth your confidence, isn't worth your self-esteem. I lastly will say that is if a workplace is not offering you learning development, mm -hmm. coaching, maybe counselling, if they're not offering anything other than your paycheck, again, they're not a working environment. Now, I know there's different things that work in zero hours, I know that's all of that, but if you're working a job where you get a salary every month and you've signed a contract and it's not a zero working hours, they should be more. What is the package you're getting? If you're not getting any of that, Unless you're getting really, really, really lot of money, you think, okay, well, I'm getting bare money. I would then say, pay for your own mental health. Do you know what I mean? I'd be like, okay, well, I'm making, I'm making six figures, fair enough. But <laughs> even that, usually they would have a lot of different, like yeah. dental care, all this stuff. Basically, I this is this is me. Get what you want. Get what you need to get from your employers. When I was working as a social worker, oh my, I got the council to pay for every <laughs> CPD, which is continuous professional development that I needed, so that I am high, more employable. So now, when I get offered jobs that I don't really work anymore, when I get offered jobs, I'd be like. Hmm, <laughs> with all my qualifications <laughs> like yeah. do you know what i'm saying because i'm yeah, i'm work. working hard i know yeah. my worth i'm oh, yeah. working hard so i need to make sure that that company is investing into me because like i said they can drop you like a hat which we've seen yeah meta has laid yeah. off people they've laid off people yeah so at the end of the day when you realize that to some people you're just a number don't give them your loyalty but work hard be effective and make sure you get what you need from a job that because at the end of the day right now there is no job security unless you're working at nhs potentially and you're a doctor well, or you're a nurse your, like nepotism family company do you know what i'm you saying know, that's probably the main no, that's probably the real job security do you know what i mean there's mm -hmm. no job security so don't be loyal to a job who can just leave you the next day tomorrow it's just it's not worth it right just be committed to your craft whatever your craft is yeah. and just be yeah. you know be integral and be a good worker mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of like um, going back to your question directly about how you can make it a safe environment, I would say if you can't make your workplace a safe environment, make sure you have good safe environments outside of work. Mm -hmm. So whether it's therapy, coaching, solid friends and family, if you ain't got none it's of that, good network. Yeah, good yeah network. if you ain't got none of that, then then come to speak to me. We, you need, you need, we need therapy. <laughs> I can give you that advice because some people don't have that at all. Yeah. That's what that's that's when um, their mental health issues get really bad because if mm -hmm. your workplace ain't great, great and your family life ain't great, your personal life ain't great. 
Okay, so that actually brings us on to our next question then. So what can people do to improve their mental health at work? You've already a little yeah, bit yeah, answered it already. But um, I, I would say first and foremost, ask yourself, is it work? Because I think it's important to us to say that sometimes. Mm, sometimes it's not work, it's, it's your own stuff right. and it's coming to work. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah that's a really good point Yeah, we've got to make accountability because I've, as a social worker, as a therapist, I've seen that sometimes, no, it ain't work, man. <laughs> you're the one being, let's, let's keep it real. You're the problem. You're, yeah, you are the problem. Let's, let's not lie. So <laughs> that is really important because sometimes it actually isn't work. It actually is the person. Yeah. You've got to make that distinction. Um, but then if it is work, then um, speak to your first um, point of call would be your land manager. Talk to your land manager. Um, now, the law says you don't have to disclose. But if you do disclose under the Equality Act, it's a protected characteristic. You know, it's a disability. Therefore, they should not discriminate, but they can. Yes. So obviously just make sure that, um, you know, a lot of people are not comfortable sharing their mental health needs because unfortunately managers are not really always good at doing that. So again, your HR is really important. Um, keep receipts, guys. So if you do share your mental health difficulties um, and you're not treated well, um, make sure it's said in writing. Say, oh, oh, can you can you email me please what you've just told me that I can't get a reasonable adjustment you know, for my dyslexia, for my ADHD, for my autism, for my, whatever it is, because then that's used as evidence if you have to go to an employee, you know, tribunal or, or what have you. But your first point of call is your line manager. Mm -hmm. If that's not handled well, then you got you, you follow the steps in your policy. Is it your the, the line manager's line manager or the HR? But I would say if you get to HR and it's not handled well, I will say start looking for another job. Um, but one thing I would always say is just keep evidence of the work that you're doing because what tends to happen is that when your mental health is struggling, they will try to say that it's affecting your work. And if it really isn't, you find it yourself, then that's when you might need to take go to your GP and say, look, I need some time off. Because mm -hmm. it's true, it might be affecting your work. But if it isn't affecting your work, then you need to again show evidence that it's not. Because right. I've got lots of clients in situations where their mental health is used um, to discriminate against them, which is totally unfair and un unreasonable. And especially if you are of colour, it complicates the matter because you don't know if it's your mental health, you don't know if it's your race, you don't know if it's your gender. You just, right. it's really confusing. So I'm a realist. I don't, again, I don't think you can unpollute a polluted area. I will say to leave um, personally. But if you choose not to leave, um, then you need to get robust outside of work. You need to get therapy, you need to get coaching, you need to make sure your family's good because that's the only way that you can be fortified to withstand work. So with me, to me, nobody can do nothing at work because I'm good. So all of this, if I went through what people are going through, I would be okay I'm very fortified. Now, eight, 10 years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was very depressed and I was really affected, but I've learned to get my voice back and I understand um, I'm not stupid anymore. I'm not. I'm not green-eyed. So for me, I, I do a good job. You can't tell me nothing. But not everyone's like that. So for most people, if you're not like that, you need to get fortified outside of your workspace. So that would be my biggest thing. If you can't do it in work and you yourself can't do it, your manager's not doing it for you. You've got to do it for yourself. Because in all honesty, if they're not going to do it, then you're going to be left there. Right. And when they do, when they do fire you, um, that's not good for the next job because now you can't even use them as a reference. That's why I said you do have to be a bit strategic because unfortunately, if human beings, which, start, which are your managers, are not looking after you, you've got, first and foremost, you've got to look after yourself. You can't even expect your managers to look after you. You hope they do. You hope it's in their contract. But some people don't do that. Some managers are not interpreting their contract properly. That's why I said go to your contract. So let me round it up. First and foremost, speak to your land manager. Actually, before that, read your policies. Go back to your contract that you signed, right? If they have written something about mental health, right, that means you can take that to your manager because they are, they are responsible to do that. Then go to your manager, because you need to make sure you're armed with knowledge. If you realize that they haven't got that, then you then you just got to hope that your manager will do that. If they do have that, that in their policy, then the manager should do that. You have more evidence to say, look, you're, you're, you're contravening your policies, right? So you read the contract, read your policies, go to your manager, then if not, go through the steps. Is it the land manager after them or the HR? But once you get to HR, if it's not, if they're still not doing well, again, keep evidence at every point in time because they can turn on you. Because HR in a lot of companies are there to protect the, the top, not even not the employees, not those at the bottom. So be bear, bear that in mind. They're meant to protect you, but they end up protecting the senior leaders, not right. yourself. So bear that in mind. If that does happen and you feel that like you're facing whatever level of discrimination or just unsupport, right? Keep evidence of that. Um, I would then say go to a lawyer. You, you got to be smart. Go to a lawyer, um, seek therapy outside. Don't let them pay for the therapy now. Seek therapy for yourself, seek coaching and get family support and obviously start applying for, for, for jobs and make sure your work, they cannot say anything about your work. 
that would be that. Um, all the nice things would be, you know, find other colleagues to support you, you know, build a team, build that kind of support group. Um, if there are employee support groups, find out who started the employee support group. Is it by the senior leaders or is it like more the employees themselves? How confidential really is it as well? Because you don't want to be talking the next minute. Your manager saying, oh, I heard that you said this. You're thinking, where did you, say, where did you hear that from? So the reason why I'm saying all of these things is because the reality of all, I see all of these things, but when you talk to people on the ground, they are not benefited from all of these employee support groups. So this sounds all good in meetings and when you do talks in companies, but the people on the ground are like, what rubbish thing is, are they doing? Like, the manager is the one that's leading that. Why am I going to sit and talk to my manager when they're the cause of my issues? So that's right. why I'm saying being realistic for a lot of people, all of these things are airy fairy talk. What you need to do on the ground is be smart, be strategic, um, future proof your career. Do not let any manager, any employer mess you up, uh, mess up your, your career, your CV, because you're just struggling because you're human. We all struggle. Mm -hmm. And also get a good GP. If your GP ain't good like mine was, then you get a new GP <laughs> because your GP, the same way growing up here, yeah, a lot of Caucasian people took sick leave. A lot of us back at Asian, we don't take sick leave. Take the sick leave, guys. <laughs> take sick leave because they all, they, all, they all have a little bit of stress when they're taking sick leave. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> take sick leave. That is your right because that is where you then have ammunition. You, you, you prepare with your family and you start planning because sometimes you can't plan when you're in work. You've got to do work. So you take your sick leave, take a week or two off, rest, recuperate recuperate and then begin to plan your exit strategy out of this um, unhealthy <laughs> working environment. That's are. my advice. I love it. I love that. Yeah, that was a I agree. Um, yeah, I guess I guess one of my sort of burning questions I want to ask just, Ooh, you know, kind of burning you know, question. You know, burning questions is like one of the most common experiences is people of color often they see people get promoted above them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, and I guess and you, you spoke a little bit about how that can impact your mental health and things and for various reasons, you know, sometimes we can't always pinpoint the reason. Mm. And sometimes it's, oh, you know. It's very obvious. Yeah, it's very obvious. <laughs> um, and things. I, I, don't, I don't know what your kind of, from a mental health perspective, about how that kind of impacts people and, um, yeah, and sort of and groups of people and things. Yeah, it impacts people a lot because I've got somebody in my head saying this because when I speak to some maybe people in their 40s now, they say, uh, I said, why are you still in this company and not being promoted? I've given so much to this company. I think it's an issue type of mentality to have, man. I don't, BS. <laughs> what? You, if, you've given, if, you give, if you've given too much to a company, they don't promote you, yeah? You're both, you're both silly because you need to understand these companies don't care for you. They care for the bottom line. Don't do that. So millennials then, because some of our Gen Z, Gen X's and baby boomers, we can't save them. Sorry, can't. they're like they're like they're fixing their ways. They're too far gone. Yeah, <laughs> from for us, those in the you know early forties, and those that are coming into the workplace at twenty one. Don't again. Don't be goes back to don't be loyal, right? Don't give. If so, if you're in a workplace, say maximum five years, and you've put in work, you're doing all the training, and you're not getting promoted, yeah. You have to leave. You shouldn't even taken you up to the five years. In all honesty, right? You see people two years, they've already gone up. Right. Not everybody wants to go up, by the way. So I didn't want to go up in social work. I could have gone and become senior. I didn't want to go up, so I left to do my own business. So I didn't want to. But if you want to, I honestly believe, um, you know, they normally do a six month to a year prom um, probation, right? Yeah. Uh, not every company does a appraisal, but they should do like a PD plan, a 360 right. feedback. If in one year, You've been in a company, you're not sitting down talking about what next. And what next could not, may not always be a promotion, it could just be another another training course. Or pay rise. Or pay rise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an issue. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't personally, I wouldn't stay more than maximum a year, year and a half in a company where I don't see there's any move, you, movability. Progression. Get any a progression. Promotion, but then someone else who's not a person of colour gets like a double promotion. Does that make sense? Like somebody, you know, we've seen the situation where, oh, the people say, oh no, but I, I did get promoted. But then the person who maybe joined after them or has less experience got like double promotions in that time. Yeah, so if you see saying. any, yeah, if you see any unfair practices and you think it's not fair, um, and it all depends on your company. If you think your company is re more than reasonable, but you just see something, you think, oh, what's going on there? Then talk about it, talk to your manager about it and say, what's going on, right? Obviously, it's confidential. They can't say, oh, well, that person. So you've got to read behind the lines. What do you think? Is it racism? Is it just that that person, I don't know, maybe she's, we don't, we don't know why that person got promoted. You've got to figure that out. If it's nothing other than just luck, fortune, or whatever, then fine. If it is something like that, and you feel like you can address it, then address it. If you don't think you can, exit, exit strategy and plan. Mm -hmm. If you don't like a working environment, you don't need to stay. 
But obviously, you've got to be smart. You've got to think of kids. You've got to think of different things. Yeah. Some people, I'll say this, some people listening have a lot of benefits. So they basically weigh it up. So you also got to weigh up the cons and pros. You might go, people get promoted more than me, but I get a really good pay rise. I get dental care. They pay for my trade. Like, you do have to weigh up kids things. Kids school care. Kids get care. Home, get some workplaces have nurseries. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Yeah. So this is why I also say, and I do get so, mm. when you add all of that context, it isn't easy for people to move as yeah. well. So you do have to work with the pros and cons. That's why it's important that you build up your personal life because sometimes you might be like, I should be promoted, but however that, I'm still on a good pay, I'm still a good salary. Maybe your child's got three more years. You're like, okay, in three years time when my child is no longer in nursery, she's gone back to primary school, I can then move. Right. So that's why I said he's got a plan and got to be strategic. strategic. You gotta say you gotta you gotta adjudicate. You've got to take stock of your life and say, okay, where am I? Where do I want to be? And what are my current circumstances? If you know that you are saving a thousand pounds a month of childcare in nursery because your workplace has it, then you might say, you know what? I'm gonna keep quiet about certain promotions for the next two years when my child is three years old. She got two more years or even a year to go into um, to reception. But once that year goes, I mean, I'm gone. <laughs> right. That's what I mean. So that's that's what I would say. But there is the employee tribunals that are ob 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 there are yeah. recourses. We now know that some recourses are mm, a bit sketchy. That's why it's all about evidence. Be right. smart. Uh, the same way your passive aggressive colleague has CC'd you and everybody else, <laughs> uh, I CC people too. <laughs> don't do, unfortunately, not in workplaces, they don't always do what they should do. Where if I've got issue if i'm going to talk to you they'll just go straight to your manager play their game you've got to play the game guys so right. i've learned the game the game is is after i have a conversation with you i am emailing you straight away following our conversation evidence. Yeah. you've yeah. got to build up evidence we've got to be smart now because some people are stacking things up against you and you're being innocently do you have here's a pie I made from home you're being so lovely and nice and then you get told oh you you're you're causing issues in the workplace and you're thinking, I bring pies. <laughs> yeah, you bring pies. I bring, I bring pies. I bring pies. I to... pie. Do you know what I mean? Great. So uh, that's what I would say. So I would say that address things as they come. Um, choose your battles wisely. Oh, um, be yeah. very sure. In, oh, and it sounds really bad, yeah, but when it comes to racism, we have to be sure nowadays because if you if you say racism and it isn't racism, next minute, oh, you're using a race card. You always right? call oh, the race card. The race, race card. card. I really hate that phrase. So, so much. be, um, but stand up for what you believe in as well. Mm -hmm. If it's worth yeah. losing a job, then lose a job. Like you got to, you know, yeah. you got to fight a battle. Some people are activists. If you're an activist and you know you might you might run, run risk losing a job, maybe make sure you get a side hustle as well. So if you yeah. lose that job, you've got a side hustle. So all I'm saying is that be smart, right? Um, take stock, use sick days. I'm not saying that they take advantage of you, but go to the GP and you stop because sometimes you can't do all of this when you're at work, right? But that's why I said you've got to take stock and you need a fortified back. You need to come in armed and you can only do it when you have space to think and reflect. So sometimes taking your annual leave to just literally recoup, plan, bring your friends around. If you've got a lawyer friend, be like, girl, let's read this contract. And before you sign that contract, read, no, please read your work. I know it's long, but read your working contract. Or get a lawyer. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, you know, hundred pounds can save you yeah. years of being in a workplace years where you're unhappy. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. For thank you today. for having me again. I absolutely, absolutely loved having you here. Please come again. <laughs> I will. I love this conversation. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, um, just for our listeners again, if you didn't catch, you know, Ngozi the first time. <laughs> She's like a doctor sister. We should, give it. Choma. we should give her a choma and we can call her toyin. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That was so good first time around. For, like, for yeah. real. That's how you know she has Nigerian friends. Yeah. <laughs> She's eating jollof rice and pounded yeah. yam. Am I like? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I do love jollof rice, actually. But anyways, yeah. Um, where can people find you? How can um, they contact you? Yeah, follow me on Instagram. So N-G-O-Z-I-C-A-D-M-U-S, Ingazi Cadmus, Instagram, LinkedIn. I'm, you know, I'm doing good on LinkedIn, you know, yeah. so follow me on LinkedIn. Yeah. But yeah, follow me on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Ingazi Cadmus on all social media platforms. And for anyone that's having any issues at work, definitely speak to myself and then my team. We can get in contact with you and see how we can support you in your workplace. And for any speaking engagements as well, I speak on topics about bringing more women of colour in leadership. 
and we need to be on boards of companies. We need to be influencing this. That's that's how we influence. So we didn't I didn't talk about that. But if you want to know how we influence, is we get onto the boards of companies and we make um, we impact decision making. That is oh. the, the power. If you're at the bottom, if you're at the bottom, now nah, we have to get to the top. So that's how we do it. Um, so yeah, any employers um, that want me to come and speak, um, uh, you're warned. I, I don't, I'm not cookie cutter. I say it how it is. I don't pacify, um, but I'm here to empower people. So yeah, holler at me at Ingersley Cadmus on all social media platforms. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Love that. Love it. Okay. Very insightful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support this podcast, Please share it with others and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Keep up to date with what we do at Diversifying Group at diversifying.com or follow us on social media at Diversifying Group. See you next time.